It's actually so cold in here that I had to do squats be around the corner to warm up. Uh, I'm very excited because um, I've been talking three different PyCons on three crazy topics that are unrelated to Python, but I still can't get rid of Python, and I still use Python 2.7, and I think uh, I'm going to enjoy this until the end of lives. Yeah. Um, the, I changed the title of my talk at the last minute because I was giving the gist of it to some people that I met yesterday, and uh, I, I told them that my talk, topic is going to explain the idea that mathematics is just programming. And they looked at me and said, well, it's obvious, right? And I had a moment to think about it, and then I realized, yeah, it's actually obvious. But the thing is, uh, I met some people at the Institute of Mathematics of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And when I told them that, they looked at me like crazy, and they didn't know what I was talking about. So a part of what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to convince it that it actually is. And to test my theory, I'm actually going to try to convince you about this as well, but explaining uh, how actually mathematicians got there. So. Here's a tiny plan, and we're going to talk about language. So we had several great talks about processing of natural language, but it tur turns out that working with formal language isn't that, that easy as well. So we know that language is a medium of communicating ideas, and mathematicians, as part of what they do, they actually communicate ideas to each other, and whatever constructions they have coming up in their heads, they have to work through explaining those things to other people, either in written form or in terms of pictures or any other kinds of things, right? And those things that mathematicians produce are called proofs, right? They come up with some statements in some language, and they try to take a series of steps and convincing arguments to, that they convene to other people or in some cases, machines. Recently, the amount of abstraction in mathematics has been growing up very fast, and they've started to look into ways of not only explaining those ideas to another humans, but also explaining those ideas to the machine, in partly because um, maybe 15, 20 years ago, there was uh, the, f the first attempt at proving the Kepler's conjecture, which was about uh, finding the optimal packing of, of spheres in the dimension number three. And it turns out uh, that the proof of this fact is very, very complex, and no human can actually verify it uh, in a reasonable amount of time. However, ironically, the proof um, of the compact packing of spheres was brought up by Ukrainian mathematician Marina Vyazovska, who uh, gave the proof for dimensions 8 and 24, who were, that were a lot, a lot easier and simpler and more elegant than the proof for dimension 3. Anyway, so now I'm going to talk about some motivations why we, people who do programming for, for work or for fun, might come up into similar problems that um, and the mathematicians have, and then I'm going to forget anything about programming, and I'm trying to, to explain some of the foundational math concepts in a programming style lingo. Anyway, so you probably know that most of the programming began from the engineer's point of view was from hacking assembly, and it isn't really convenient to specify a lot of uh, good abstractions in, in assembly, so people came up with a macro system for assembly that they call C. Right. Later then, they had to come up with an idea of getting more abstractions and the ability to define macros on top of macros, and they came, came up with Lisp. And I can't really figure out how we got here, but the, the, the idea of crippling Lisp and making a different programming language that's currently called Python became more successful than actually Lisp. So that's still a mystery to me. But this is, how we're, this is where we are now. Anyway, 
I'm going to sidestep from Python and untyped languages and going to talk about typed programming languages. So the idea of types in programming languages, I think it first appeared in Fortran, where Fortran had two types in language. One was an integer, a discrete object, and the other one was a floating point number, a real number, which is a continuous object. And Fortran's compiler needed it to figure out which processor instructions to emit at what point of time. Um, another good abstraction that appeared in the world of computer programming is polymorphism. You could have seen it in, in languages like C++, where you could overload the operator plus and make it mean different thing, things in different contexts. Or other versions of polymorphism, we can call the same function on the um, different arguments of different types, which is commonly called ad hoc polymorphism. It's also a lot of ideas from using types came into helping the compiler figure out how to manually manage memory. For example, in Objective-C and Swift, you can annotate your variables so the compiler can emit reference counting automatically. Uh, in a language called Rust, there's this pretty cool idea called session types that lets you specify the lifetime of objects and the number uh, of times you can reuse the same variable or stuff like that to achieve pretty much the same thing. There are a lot of specialized languages. For example, it's a lot easier to process uh, semi-structured text using languages like awk that lets you uh, do pattern-directed scanning or specify styles for web pages using CSS, right, which is everyone's fa favorite programming languages, because one of the recent implementations turned out to be Turing complete, so you actually can write any programs you like. Anyway, TensorFlow is a good example of having an embedded DSL for neural networks, because as you know, for a programming language's point of view, a neural network is any abstract syntax tree that you can define a, a gradient on. So if you can define a gradient, you can backpropagate, and that constitutes a neural network. So a neural network is just, if you can come up with a gradient, you can fit it into the net, not just convolutions or recurrent layers and stuff like that. Also, Prolog it lets you do uh, backtracking in a very principled way, which is pretty cool. Anyway, I had this impression during uh, the keynote talk where the keynote speaker kept saying things like, please do not do this, or please do not do that, right? And we pretty much often would like to have some, some system that wouldn't actually let us do that, let alone uh, have us shoot our, let us shoot ourselves in the foot for no reason. And what if there was like a study of how, how precise we can get well, trying to specify our intentions. Well, I already made some examples with using typed cool features from type programming languages and macros from untyped programming languages, and you can see a bunch of examples in, in on my slide. One of those that I didn't mention is that it's, for example, it's a lot easier to do concurrency in Erlang than it's to Python, and but you cannot do memory layout for your data structures in R, for example. You have to do it in assembly. So two years ago, I was here in Lviv, and I spoke about Haskell, a language with an expressive type system. And a part of the motivation for me for doing this talk is to let you see what happens to you if you get hang up in Haskell for too long. So there's this trend of using dependently typed languages that let you have types that depend on values. And I'm going to uh, try to explain what this means. OK, so from a big picture point of view, a using a dependently typed language is another approach for, for enforcing software quality, uh, f which is also an engineer's point of view. So say you're already trying to apply some ad hoc testing with using practices like TDD or BDD or whatever, right? You can also let your computer generate random sequences of strings and and check properties in those sequences, which is known as quick check. And there's a great library for Python to do that, which is called Hypothesis. And there's also a way to do model checking, which uses an idea of satisfaction modulo th theories and a model checker called Z3, which is released by Microsoft is used in a lot of compilers, for example. But dependent types let you do 
go an extra mile in terms of specifying the correctness of your code, which is you actually attach a proof of, of a certain property with your code, and when you run the program, when it compiles, it actually checks those proofs at every time. So there's this project called DeepSpec, which is a research project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation of the United States, um, which is which tries to do all of this. Essentially, it, it, it wants to give you a set of tools, starting with a compiler for, uh, for a register transfer, from a higher level language to a register transfer level language, which lets you specify the behavior of transistors and chips. It gives you a compiler for C that, that has uh, verified optimization steps at every step of the way. For example, if you write a program in C, and then, you, and then you run a compiler that emits assembly code, you would like to know that every optimization at every part of the pipeline of the compiler emits equivalently in code, which is more efficient. But that fact requires proof. And CompCert has a, uh, as, its, as its main idea, is to get, let you have this compiler that has every optimization of its own, which is verified. OK, it also. Uh, works on a 30 cos OS kernel. So uh, by OS kernel, you usually understand a set of scheduling uh, algorithms and uh, device multiplexing algorithms, which is pretty much a big piece of complex software, which also needs to have a lot of its properties verified. For example, for um, real-time embedded systems, you would really like it to um, have your scheduling be actually fair. And if you invent a fa fairly fair scheduling algorithm, you have to actually somehow convince the computer that it's actually fair, not only experimentally, and like probably see that no nothing ever happens bad to it. And there's also, uh, it also w w works on a set of tools that actually do let you do lightweight verifying, such as quick check, right? So, for example, where how do you do it in code is that I'm going to show you, well, this is the definition of a monoid. It's an interface uh, which represents a mathematical structure. It has an identity element and a, an operation, which is sometimes called a product or a sum. And if you try to implement a monoid in Haskell and you look at the definition of a monoid, you see that your monoid has to satisfy three laws. The first is called the left identity, which means if you take the neutral element, which is an ID, and you multiply it on something, you get the same element. Or the right uh, identity, which means that you, if you have the identity on the right, it does the same thing. And the third law is called associativity. It basically means it doesn't matter whenever you um, where the braces are, or the brackets, whatever. So if you think of monoids, you can, you, you can define two monoids for uh, numbers, one on multiplication and one, and one on uh, plus and zero, or you can define a monoid in strings where an, an identity element is an empty string and stuff like that. You can also define a monoid on matrices where an identity would be just the unit. So instead of... Uh, having those laws in the in the documentation, we would like to lift those laws into the code. And dependent types lets you do that. So see here, it says for all x, y, z of type A, if we apply the operation to x, and then an operation of y and z, we get the same thing as the thing the thing on the right. And the types become dependent, where you say for all x, y, z of type A you actually lift the, lift the value of this operation into the type, which makes it dependent. So you embed the proof of invariance into, into your code. But this comes at a big price. So this is still not mainstream programming, but there's a lot of ongoing research that lets you do that. And another thing, it turns out that dependent times is a gateway drug for mathematics. So now I'm going to slightly back off from thinking about programming languages and software and quality and engineering and talk more about what mathematics have to deal with. And you will actually find out that the 
common system of formalizing mathematics that's accepted everywhere, say, in Ukraine, is quite primitive. So, so we define a syntax for computation of what we call a programming language. Formal systems is a syntax for doing math inference, which is mathematics used to make convincing arguments, right? So the complexity of proofs is increasing in case of uh, Kepler's conjecture. There are branches of math that are called category theory that try to study uh, generalized algebraic constructions and study their behavior in general. It gets super, super abstract, but uh, you already need a way to formalize this stuff. So there are three, there's this co core uh, brand discipline called logic, and who in this audience has uh, rigorous experience in mathematical log logics from university? Okay, so probably half, right? Who, who think they're pretty confident with their skills in logic? Okay, almost a half, which is pretty okay. Um, so, for those who didn't, I'm gonna show you that it's actually pretty cool. And it's actually like a mother of programming languages. Anyway, so I'm also going to mention ideas from proof theory, which studies proofs themselves as mathematical objects, and ideas from domain theory, which studies logics as mathematical objects. So basically, you have to have a way of defining syntax for a formula and then having semantics for it. But in any case, if you see if you think of different con of the same concepts under different name, don't be surprised because this is just the way things are. Um, yeah. So there are a lot of classes of logic. I, I shrink them down to just three, where, where one is propositional logic, first order logic, and higher order logic. And the uh, working horse of mathematics is the first order logic. But first, I'm gonna uh, show you this slide. So who remembers truth tables? Okay, so who thinks their uh, logic stops at knowing about truth tables? Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, so the thing is, uh, some of you were doing logic by trying to find a satisfactable set of uh, truth values for a formula, which is called a satisfiability problem, by drawing those truth tables for a formula. And this is an example for, for truth table for disjunction. Um, but it turns out that, th that doing the satisfiability implies that you already have a model for a, a formula. In this case, this is a Boolean algebra. And it, uh, choosing a proper model for logic is a philosophical problem that we shall see later. But I wanted to give you a model for a Boolean algebra, and I actually lo lost some of my slides. but. Um, I'm gonna tell you this story anyway, and the slides come up, it won't be a problem. So I was actually walking through Lviv, um, and I s was passing by the Lviv University and saw this plaque on the building that says Stanislav Ulam. He lived in this building, and he worked in Monte Carlo methods that contributed to a lot of mathematics. And I took the photo of this, um, of this plaque, and I posted it on Instagram, and I got likes, and, and then I, then, then I remembered that when I was browsing through Facebook, I've seen people from Reef mention a Scottish cafe. Do you know about the Scottish cafe? Okay, so I'm going to tell you the story anyway. <laughs> so uh, there's this cafe where a lot of uh, prominent mathematicians from Lviv School of Mathematics were gathering in 1930s, and. Uh, the, while they were gathering, they were actually writing down math problems on, on napkins because they didn't have GitHub in the cloud, right? So, and this was really annoying the proprietor of the cafe, so uh, somebody gave them a, a big notebook where all of the mathematicians were, uh, were writing down their problems, and it had like more than 140 problems from all sorts of mathematicians, and I was, Browsing through the copy of this book later, so if you go to the restaurant, you can ask for a copy and you, know, you can look for it. And I found the problem number 136, which was posed by von Neumann, which, who asked, "Is there? Can you define a measure on a Boolean algebra?" I was pretty excited because he actually gave the whole definition of the Boolean algebra uh, in, in this. Uh, 
in this book, and I wanted to post it as a slide, but apparently got lost somewhere, so we'll probably find it later. Anyway, so another class of the logic is is the first order logic, which adds those things called quantifiers. The thing on the left is the universal, and the right is an existential. And unless you basically enumerate or prove assert existence of all variables under the domain of quantification, right? But uh, those domains had to be defined outside the logic. So basically, they had a set of defining formulas without having data types. They had no data types in their language. So. Uh, in a sense, first order uh, theory is the Django of mathematics in the sense that you use Django to do all sorts of web development in Python, and what, that's what mathematics were doing. So if you take the first order logic with its basic set of rules, you add some axioms and add rules of inference on top of those axioms, you get the first order theory, which is the sort of the thing mathematicians would like to talk about. And whenever you have a theory, you have to prove some method theory stuff on top of it, you have to say that if I have an axiomatic theory on top of first order logic, I have to say that it's sound and complete, which means you cannot have two formulas that, well, you cannot have a single formula such that you can prove both truth and falsehood for, for it, and you cannot define a formula that's not provable at all, which means that the logic would be the axiomatic theory of inc would be incomplete. And these are the examples of first order theories. Uh, two really famous are the Pressburger arithmetics and piano arithmetics. Tarski's real closed fields were, was an example of a theory that could axiomatize uh, analytic geometry. Uh, pretty much every branch of extra, well, theory inside of extra abstract algebra could be axiomatized using group, uh, using first order logic. For one of the examples is the theory of groups, or you could say a theory of monoids. So the thing that I showed you before, you could just axiomatize on top of first order logic and prove things about it in it. And the most important theory on top of first order logic is the set theory. You probably remember it from your university courses. And it turns out there were a lot of, a lot variants, patches to the set theory that was first developed by Cantor. So Cantor's idea for sets would be the collections of objects, and they're pretty much similar to sets that you see as data structures in the programming languages. And set also gave this notion of a function and a lot of other cool things. And there were a lot of additions to it. One of the Termilo's set theory, then Frankel found some problems with it and sent a pull request to him. Uh, w then they had this termilo frankel set th theory, and then they also added an axiom of choice because without it, it would be hard to do some of the math mathematics. So it's important to, to see that when we talk about set theory, we can think about many kinds of ideas, and a lot of people who do blackboard mathematics, they just assume some of, your, some of axioms of this set theory and they use it rather informally. But whenever you try to prove something really formally, you have to actually state which axioms you're using. And um, that makes math doing mathematics a lot more verbose and, and harder, so people don't actually do that. Right? Which, in part, was really a showstopper for me, because I couldn't really understand some of the arguments that some people were making. And, uh, without, they, they unfortunately could not give a formal proof about it. Okay, so for some reason I listed all of the axioms on the slides, but the most important here is the axiom of choice, because it basically means that it allows you assert an existence of magic elements in the sets that do not exist. And this is also a philosophical problem, because asserting things that don't exist doesn't really come up with the idea of programming. Okay, so now I want to show you a pretty cool idea in set theory that you've probably seen all of those signs of, that mean something about sets, and I like to call them macros because the only uh, symbol that uh, mathematicians added to first order the logic to design set theory is this existence thing. And the other thing, you can just implement them as macros. So this is, for example, this is the axiom of an unordered pair, which just says that if you have two elements, you can, they are a pair, and this is like the main way of constructing sets from tiny things. And this actually expands to a bunch of quantifiers and equality 
and the IFF proposition. This, is, this proposition actually doesn't exist in first logic as well. It's also a macro, but it makes the presentation tidier. OK, so, so doing mathematics, it turns out, formally is coming up with a set of macros on top of first order theory, proving soundness and completeness, and we're done, right? Not really. OK, so Bertrand Russell is a mathematician in the beginning of the 20th century. He had a hackathon, uh, which he had for many years, where he wanted to say his philosophical idea that you have to prove arguments using, using only logic. And he tried to encode a lot of mathematics using logic. So he also wanted to use Cantor's set theory to, to make a lot of arguments. But he, he during this work, he, his work, he encountered a paradox that's called the Russell's paradox, uh, which, which, if you played Portal, is used to um, kill GLaDOS or this other guy, right? Never mind. So it says, does a set of all sets contain itself? Or in, in English, that would also mean, consider you have a town and there's a barber who shapes everyone who doesn't have a barber. The question is, does the barber uh, make haircuts to himself? So this is a paradox that you can come up with in the Cantor set theory. So Russell came up with a hack because he had to do a demo uh, at the last day of the hackathon, and he came up with an idea of types. So we're going to add some hacks that we're going to say that we cannot have the Russell paradox just because uh, that's the way it is. So this was the first idea of using a type. OK, another problem with uh, Russell's hackathon was it took him two volumes and the, to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So this proposition that 1 plus 1 actually equals 2 was stated in the first book, and its proof was stated in the second book. Uh, it, as you can tell, this is probably a lot of verbose work to actually get something simple as that to be done. Um, OK, so sometime later, there was this prominent German mathematician, David Hilbert, who uh, posed a series of challenges to mathematicians around the world and saying, is there an axiomatic formal system that lets us do all of the mathematics? Well, he actually posed a lot of different open questions, but for the sake of this argument, we're going to just think about this one. OK, so then came uh, Kurt Gödel, who showed two incompleteness theorems and proved them and actually put Hilbert's program to a stop, which he said that uh, basically you cannot prove the consistory consistency of a theory inside the theory. Otherwise, if you've proved it, you have an inconsistent theory. And if your system is powerful enough to encode arithmetic, like in uh, piano arithmetic, you cannot prove its consistency. So a any sufficiently useful formal theory cannot be pr proved to be useful. In a well, it can be useful, but it cannot be for logically correct. But the, one of the core ideas in the Gödel's proof to do that was to use the Gödel's numbering. He used the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which basically says that any number is either a prime or a product of primes. So using that hack, you can actually encode information. And he used it for lack, lack of data types. And his main idea was interpret logics and formulas in the logic as a multiplic big multiplication of different prime numbers. So basically, his idea, let's take logic, interpret it as, as prime numbers, as their multiplication, and work it with numbers instead. So that's just what he did. Around the time, uh, there was Alonzo Church. Uh, who came up with this formalism of lambda calculus, which, had, which is the wor world's coolest programming language ever because it has three programming constructs. And one of them is variable, another is lambda abstraction, and the dot, I used it to specify the, the function application. So below you can see there are like two examples of formulas in lambda calculus which try to simulate Booleans. So it basically, it's a function that takes two arguments and then applies the first to the second and the first, right? P to Q to P, right? And below, this is how you represent false. So he gave this idea of instead of using 
uh, prime numbers and multiplication of them on the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, he was using uh, this idea of encoding data types as lambda terms, which is called the church encoding, and it's pretty important as well in, in computer science. So later, um, to put it simply, his students, Kleene and Rosser, they came up with the term that lets, uh, a, a, let's church as lambda calculus terms not normalize. So, for example, if you take this term, which is called the Y combinator, and if you apply it to it, if you basically try to evaluate, you will see that it actually returns to itself. So it, this term doesn't have a normal form, which was also a problem and rendered uh, church as lambda calculus uh, inconsistent to be used as a mathematical programming language. So then came Gerd Genten with his thesis, Habilitation Shrift. And he said that, first of all, well, it's not a really good idea to encode proofs as, uh, and formulas as numbers. So, and he showed the result that you, you can tie a consistency of one theory to another theory and say that if uh, my theory is consistent, if Termelo Frankel's with choice system is also consistent. And he also showed that you can prove your model to be consistent. And if you give it a model where it is consistent. Basically, if you come up with another mathematical objects and you reinterpret uh, your formulas in it instead of using numbers. So he decided, what if we take another compiler for our formulas? Okay, then he came up with this calculus of natural deduction where he tried to sidestep the idea of using first order logic and axioms and tried to come up with a set of rules to construct those formulas and so he basically wanted to mirror the way people just reason and move the domain of reasoning to some other thing, which is, would be the, his model of logic. So basically, with the things that he allowed to have is that you could run the proof, which is something which Church also did with his lambda calculus, except uh, natural deduction had, had this idea of the strong normalization property that uh, the thing specified in natural deduction would always normalize to a normal form. And he gave this uh, uh, no notation for doing specifying logics, which is called, it's kind of called Genson trees because of the way how you draw them. But people also call it natural deduction, but natural deduction is the system of logic that he used to do in it. So it's kind of confusing, but anyway. So whenever you see these bars, and, and, and see the word judgment, it, it all call, all call, comes from Genson. So he gave an idea of a scope of variables, uh, a, a notion of judgments, and a notion of entailment. So an entailment is the thing that basically means having this, you can deduce this. And he gave a syntax for inference rules, which says uh, if, if this, then that, and he gave a syntax for giving axioms. So. This is an example of having a rule, an inference rule in natural deduction. And uh, in his habilitation, uh, well, in his work in natural deduction, he gave systems of two logics, one of which was called system L LK, which was classical logic, which I'm going to explain where it is later, and intuitionistic logic, which is also going to be important. Well, so here when the, where the slide comes, so yeah. I was going to talk that this model could be also interpreted in a Boolean algebra, which was uh, one of the Genson's insights. And this is actually the slide that gi gives a definition of Boolean algebra uh, by von Neumann's writing. Isn't that cool? It was in 1937. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk philosophy. So in uh, Boolean logic, you can derive this formula. Well, if you have this form P or not P, and uh, if you interpret it in Boolean logic, in Boolean algebra, you can conclude this true. But what does it mean, P or not P? So th this law is called the law of exclude middle because it kind of comes with the logic and it's called, and the logic that has this law in, among others is called the classical logic. Uh, he claimed that this law universally made no sense because you can say that if P is a judgment, then you can say that P has a, pro has a proof 
and not p means proof has a reputation, refutation. And if you say p or not p, this means for any problem, you can either say that it's true or it's false, which doesn't really make no sense because, for example, uh, pun intended, p or np, it, the equality of those two complexity classes is indeterminate, which is an open problem, right? So the classical logic doesn't allow to reason about those things. If you try to encode it in classical logic, you can just, you have to prove that it's either true or false. So it also sort of coincides with the idea of decidability. If you've thought about decidable theories, you can say that the, um, uh, the, the, the logical formula is universally provable inside the theory. Well, if it's inside the theory, I shouldn't say universally. So anyway, uh, if you can prove this, this means the theory on top in, that you use the logic for is decidable. But you cannot prove it inside the logic, so you have to go into the module. It's, uh, it's a thing. Um, so his great insight was that if you want to create a mathematical object, you have to explicitly give a way of constructing it, which was departing from the ideas of Hilbert and classical mathematicians and the use of axiom of choice that lets you state that you cannot have a you can pull an object in us out of thin air or assert its existence. So this movement was called into intuitionism. It was called constructivism in USSR. And mathematicians like Kolmogorov, Markov, and all the others, others were, were, had some minor differences with Brouwer. And ironically, I had a book from Heiting, which is a student of Brouwer's, which called Introduction to in Intuitionism, and was translated by under guidance of Markov. And he had footnotes all over the place saying, well, this is how we do it in constructivism, which is pretty fun to read. Uh, mathematicians are so, such nerds. Um, so this is an example. Well, if you're, if you're geek in logic and you remember De Morgan's laws that you could use uh, to simplify your formulas in your discrete mathematics class. So this is the proof that it, it implies excluded middle. Anyway, so when we talk about classical mathematics, when you hear this term, you can think that just using ZFC and first order logic. And one of the problems of Brouwer was to find a way how into initial logic, the logic that doesn't, uh, doesn't have P or NP as true, uh, that it has a connection to classical logic. So he worked really hard on that. And there was this uh, proof uh, that says is phi is a propositional formula, then phi is a classical tautology is not not phi is a intuitionistic tautology. Means tautology means it has a proof, essentially. So, ironically, uh, a version of this proof for propositional logic was given by Vitaly Glivenko, who was a Ukrainian-born mathematician who worked with Kolmogorov under Luzin in, in, in Moscow. And the fact that he worked on that problem, I found in his obituary, which is the letter you send to a newspaper when somebody dies, written by Kolmogorov. And Kolmogorov only speaks, uh, so he, he says what, how that Glivenko was a good man. He worked on a lot of mathematics, and then, then he lists a bibliography in his obituary, basically listing all the works uh, of Glimenko, which is pretty moving, I guess. Okay, so this also was worked on by Kurt Gödel and Gensen, and this basically shows that by using this idea of double negation translation uh, into initial trinistic and constructive logics are connected, and under some interpretation you can say that Classical logic is basically when you erase some content from classical propositions. So if you take, well, if you take into intuitionistic proposition, you erase some content, you get classical proposition. But what does it mean to erase content? So consider this question when your friend asks you, are you gonna have juice or coke? And you say yes. Right? It doesn't mean anything. Well, it actually is a valid statement in, in classical propositional logic. Uh, 
right? But it's actually meaningless in constructive logic because if you specify the rules for it in natural deduction, you will see that to assert that you can use the, well, to use the proof of disjunction, you have to specify which part of the or you have. So if you were using internationalistic logic, it would, would be meaningless. So there's this idea that was interpreted by Brower, Heiting, Kolmogorov, Genson, Kari, Howard, De Brown, and Wadler, which is basically a lot of interpretations of the same thing as I see of proof rele relevance, that first of all, proofs are mathematical objects themselves. So in a sense that juice or coke, you have to say which one, so you use the actual mathematical object rather than some information derived from the proof, that's the first thing. You probably could have seen Philip Wadler's uh, 2015 paper or his t talk on st Strange Loop that deeply inspired me, for example, where he talked about this whole idea and the whole story behind propositions as types and proofs as programs. But this is what essentially we mean with that mathematics is, is programming. That if you have a type in a programming languages, you can think of it as a proposition in a dependently typed calculus. And it's the term that inhabits the type is the proof. Okay. So there's also this book that's called Constructive Mathematics and Computer Programming, like this big. Uh, it actually has this notion of a type that, that's been called a task by Kolmogorov. So like you have a problem or you have a task and you write a program for it, it means you've solved the task. So like under this interpretation, it, it makes me think of outsourcing for some reason. But uh, in, in this way, uh, managers should be writing types and like developers should be writing proofs for those types of programs, terms that they have in those types. So there's uh, a lot of mathematicians were considering intuitionistic logic useless because it was quite limiting. So this took uh, Eric Bishop to actually reinvent calculus using a different logic formally. So he actually showed that intuitionistic style of reasoning is actually different. And he basically had to reinvent calculus without using the axiom of choice or using a different variant of axiom of choice, which doesn't use the log excluded middle. Uh, basically, this means if you have less laws, you get stronger results. Well, there is no way to think differently, right? And to support Bishop, Martin Love created a type theory, which was a replacement for for the formalism of using first order logic and higher order logic in this really neat way uh, of having types and proof of those types, right? Which has this interpretation on Brower, Harding, Kalmogorov as to prove two things, you have to give both proofs and so on. So in, in, a, in, in that interpretation that if you prove an and, you have to give a pair, which is like a tuple in Python or in Haskell. And Along that came this idea, uh, which we're going to need to use for later, is synthetic mathematics. So you could probably remember uh, Genson's, uh, well, not Genson's, but Euclid's geometry in, in, in your high school that ma made you think of uh, points and lines. And you never actually got to define what those things were. You just were working with points and lines. And you were using analytic uh, Later, you were learning in your first year of university analytic geometry when you were actually explaining what those things are in terms of real numbers and, and their properties. And this is the hack that mathematicians needed to build up because instead of, for them, using set theory was like hacking an assembly, and if you define things in assembly, you can just get rid of it and come up with a synthetic theory. And it turns out there's a deep connection, which is my last point today, that and it turns out that types in uh, Martin Love's type theory, which is the calculus behind all of the dependently typed languages, correspond to spaces in homotopy theory, which study uh, mathematical objects after homotopy, which is a continuous deformation. Um, there's also this work on the univalence axiom, which lets you consider equivalent things in the sense you have an isomorphism here and back as equal things which lets you simplify proofs, and there's this great deal of work in homotopy type theory. And their also main thing is that they do not contradict classical mathematics, but subsume it, which means it can encode a, lot, a great deal more of mathematical sort of humanity. <laughs>
So you can look at the table. You can try some proofs. So if you really want to get started, just get an Idris or Cock and Agda and start trying to prove things about your programs or implementing algorithms this way. And it's going to be jolly good fun. So if you're a student, go talk to your professor if you don't have a mathematical logic course and ask them about this. If you do not have a logic department like my university, well, my faculty does, we actually outsource logic to the philosophy department and they do not know what logic is, which is kind of a problem. Uh, go talk to you probability professors because if they were studying from Kolmogorov's descendants, they probably know what, what you're going to be talking about. And to prove theorems, you don't actually need a GPU, which means it's a lot cheaper. OK, I wanted to finish off with a thing that I, I thought that, hey, this is a great quote that says that the greatest mathematician is the guy who knows analogies between proofs. And turns out he, Banach actually extended this quote that the ultimate mathematician is the guy who sees analogies between analogies. But if you get to see analogies between proof, proofs, that would be pretty cool as well. So thank you.